Good evening, everybody, and um, uh, welcome to uh, this evening's lecture. My name is Nick Pierce. I'm the Professor of Public Policy and Director of the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath. And um, tonight, I'm delighted uh, that we are able to be joined by Professor John Hannigan for what is, I think, the penultimate uh, event in a series that we've been running at the Institute on uh, our oceans. Um, our oceans are deep dive, as we've called it. Um, and the series has been looking right across um, the disciplinary piece on different aspects of uh, the study of our oceans from uh, climate change through to conservation, through to the impact of trade and economics. Um, the, the, the last of our sessions was on the history of the oceans and how historians are thinking about maritime history and oceanic history. And today we're turning to questions of geopolitics. And um, I'm very pleased in that regard to welcome John Hannigan, who's Professor of Sociology at the University of Toronto, Scarborough. Um, his research focuses on environmental issues, the geopolitics of oceans. He's called for a new sociology of the oceans um, and is the author of um, a number of really important texts, the environmental sociology, fantasy city, pleasure, and profit in the postmodern city, the geopolitics of deep oceans, a, a recent book with Polity Press, uh, and a spectacular, uh, the rise of spectacular American 1950s. And in his current research project, Flammable Ice, Environmental Risk at the Frontier of Unconventional Energy Production, he explores the scientific construction of risk to offshore methane hydrate extraction. So loads to learn from John um, as he brings uh, his sociological environmental perspectives to bear on these questions of the oceans. And following John's lecture, I'm also delighted to say that we'll hear some brief responses from our colleagues at the University of Bath. First, we'll have, um, uh, uh, sorry, I've got my wrong way around here, but I'm going to say it slightly differently, uh, Dr. Philippe Blondel, um, uh, who's uh, co-founder and deputy director of the Centre for Space, Atmospheric and Oceanic Science at the University of Bath, uh, and then um, a lecturer in global political economy in part of social and policy sciences, Dr. Aureli Charles, and Philippe and Aureli will give their responses, and then what I'll do is I'll open it up to discussion uh, and debate, feed your questions in, uh, and we'll put those to, uh, to John and to Philippe and to Aureli. Uh, before we start, however, I'm just going to ask for a little bit of housekeeping, some housekeeping notes I need to share with you all. If you're on social media, please do tag us at IPR, the University of Bath IPR. Um, please note that your camera and microphones will remain switched off. If you have a question, put your question in via the uh, Q&A function, and we'll do our best to respond to those uh, questions. And I'll finally just say that the session is being recorded um, so filming and photography is taking place and subject to there being no technical dis difficulties, uh, the session will be available online as a podcast and a video at a later date. So thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, that's enough from me. And I'm now going to ask John, I'm going to pass over to John. Welcome, John. Uh, over to you. OK, well, thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction, Nick. Um, I was going to say um, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you uh, in Bath, except I guess I'm only uh, with you virtually, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's, it's still a pleasure. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to um, be talking today, as the title says, about the geopolitics of, of deep oceans. Um, and um, I, I want to um, just find... Let's, um, hang on. Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm going to start off with a very recent event. And that is uh, last month uh, in April, the Canadian government announced that it had uh, approved um, a giant project called Bay de Nord. Uh, it's a, uh, if it happens, um, it will be a $12 billion uh, oil and gas drilling project in the North Atlantic Ocean, um, 500 kilometers or 310 miles off the coast of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, the, um, there are two um, companies behind it. Um, one is the, the giant uh, Norwegian uh, energy company, Equinor. Equinor. Uh, and its partner, uh, Synovus Energy. Uh, if they decide to proceed, uh, Bay de Nord will be Canada's first deep water energy project. Um, drilling will uh, reach about 1,200 meters, or that's uh, 4,000 feet. Uh, and you can see in, the, um, in this first slide, um, 
That's what one of those offshore drilling platforms looks like. Um, now, evidently in Bay de Nord, uh, they've moved into next generation uh, drilling platforms that look more like ships uh, than like traditional uh, drilling platforms. Um, so um, this project is, is going to um, go down to 4,000 feet. Uh, according to the Reuters wire service, the project um, has come uh, to symbolize the tension uh, between Canada's climate goals uh, and concerns about energy security in the uh, wake of Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. Um, and um, yeah, at the same time, uh, as we'll see, um, there are also uh, tensions, environmental tensions. Um, the target for Bay de Nord is 300 million barrels of light crude oil. Uh, this could rise to closer to a billion barrels over its 30-year uh, uh, lifespan. Um, so it could certainly uh, uh, make a difference in terms of eventually contributing uh, to replacing r Russian oil in Western Europe. Uh, but not surprisingly, environmental groups uh, oppose uh, Bay de Nord uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, um, but one is, is uh, and I think this is maybe quite obvious, that um, environmental groups argue that Bay de Nord will discourage cuts in the emission uh, needed in order to uh, avert the impending um, climate crisis as predicted in the most recent, recent IPCC uh, report. Um, now, I, to appreciate the scale of Bay de Nord, uh, I want to stop just for a moment and compare it uh, to deep water drilling projects in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, deep water drilling is not new. It doesn't start with uh, Bay de Nord. They've been doing that um, uh, down in the Gulf of Mexico for quite some time. Um, the most devastating offshore oil spill in American history was the Deepwater Horizon um, disaster in uh, 2010. Um, this occurred when uh, the drilling rig was working in uh, waters more than uh, something like 4,130 4, feet deep, um, which, as you'll notice, uh, is um, very, very close uh, to the uh, drilling level of Bay de Nord. Uh, the, according to the Ameri American um, technology um, News site, news website called The Verge. Uh, deep water drilling in the Gulf has taken off in recent years. Uh, from 2000 through uh, 2009, uh, only 15% of the production in the Gulf of Mexico uh, came from ultra deep um, drilling operations, where uh, and this can extend to 1,500 meters um, or down to 5,000 feet or more. Um, now, this refers to where they're drilling. It doesn't refer to how far they go into uh, the ocean floor. Uh, they go quite a bit beyond that into the ocean floor. Uh, but that's just where the drilling, oper uh, drilling is happening. Um, so from 2000, 2009, 15% of uh, oil production in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, five years ago, in 2017, um, this figure rose to 50% of all um, oil production in the Gulf. Um, it's a huge jump from 15% all the way up uh, to half. Um, so clearly, um, the deep ocean is seriously in play as a resource frontier. The deeper they go, uh, the higher the risk, unfortunately. Uh, an analysis of oil and gas uh, production in the Gulf of Mexico from um, 1996 to 2010 found uh, that the probability of a serious accident, fatality, injury, um, explosion, uh, or fire being reported grows by 8.5% with every additional 100 feet of depth at which an offshore, offshore platform uh, operates. And indeed, um, you know, with the deep water horizon, um, working in waters more than 40, 130 feet deep and boring through 35,000 feet of uh, ocean, caught fire and spilled um, more than 200 gal million gallons uh, into the Gulf. Uh, so the, um, 
you know, in addition to uh, those concerns about uh, uh, ultra deep water uh, drilling um, expressed by environmentalists with regards to, um, you know, larger, uh, larger issues, climate related, uh, climate change related issues, uh, there are very real um, issues having to do with uh, um, spillage uh, on a, a mega scale. Um, okay, having said that, um, in my talk today, uh, I want to do two things. First of all, I'll endeavor to briefly answer two questions. The first is, what does the contemporary geopolitical landscape of deep oceans look like? Um, and from what histories has it emerged? And then second of all, I want to present a more detailed case history of deep sea mining. I think this is not something uh, I don't think we've um, that's been covered uh, in, in any depth uh, in, in the series of talks so far. Um, and um, arguably, uh, deep sea mining um, is or will become one of the most important environmental stories of the next uh, quarter century. Um, so I'm going to um, start uh, giving a very brief profile of um, uh, geopolitics uh, during the Cold War, or geopolitics of oceans uh, during the, the Cold War. Um, and to a certain extent, the current geopolitical landscape uh, of deep oceans, and deep oceans, by the way, um, or anything uh, underneath uh, 200 meters or 630 feet. Um, the current geopolitical landscape is an extension of that which existed uh, during the Cold War in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, it's different in, in some very important ways, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, but the international political tensions of that era were played out uh, in the deep, where uh, uh, US and Soviet submarines incessantly tracked one another uh, across the globe. Um, if you're a um, culture vulture, uh, at least in terms of movies of the era, uh, you'll remember um, movies such as Ice Station uh, Zebra came out in 1968. Later on, The Hunt for Red October in 1990. Um, you know, the, um, certainly the, the oceans were um, alive with, with uh, uh, competing uh, submarines. Um, after 1957, the Cold War uh, arms race uh, escalated uh, when the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik 1. Uh, the first artificial Earth satellite. Uh, this was seen as a direct challenge to the technological supremacy of the United States. Um, less than a year later, in August, uh, um, the USS Nautilus, um, the world's first nuclear power submarine, became the first to reach the uh, geographic North Pole underwater. Uh, and then um, six months uh, after that, uh, in March, the USS Skate, and that's a photo of the Skate on the screen, um, became the first submarine to surface at the, the North Pole. Um, and uh, the United States um, was overjoyed uh, at this. The, the Nautilus commander, William Anderson, was awarded the Legion of Merit by Professor, or by President Dwight Eisenhower uh, as a result of that. Um, in, in the last two decades, um, there have been um, To the critical mass of uh, really um, fascinating um, historical research. Um, some of the authors of this uh, are uh, uh, Jacob Darwin Hamblin, Naomi Oreskes, Ronald Dole, others. Um, and what these historians have done is they've documented how oceanographic scientific research during this era um, was largely funded through defense spending, uh, notably that provided by the U.S. Uh, uh, Office of Naval Research. Uh, Oreskes, for example, um, and uh, you know, this is uh, her book, Science on a Mission, up on the screen. Um, Oreskes argues that the discovery of hydrothermal vents on the seafloor um, was only made possible um, by patronage from uh, the Office of Naval Research. Um, that is, the, uh, that kind of patronage uh, led to the development of deep submergence uh, research vehicles. Uh, the best known of these was the Alvin, the first and foremost, uh, uh, most durable, submersible, capable of uh, exploring the deep sea. 
Ronald Dole highlights a stunning piece of research in 1957 conducted by uh, geologists and oceanographic photographers, uh, um, Bruce Hazen and uh, uh, Maria Tharp, Marie, Marie Tharp. Uh, Hazen and Tharp generated the first comprehensive map um, of um, an ocean basin, and it provided crucial evidence in support of the um, theory of plate uh, te tectonics. Um, and by the way, if any of you are interested in, um, you know, the topic of women in science and the challenges that they faced, uh, there, there's a fascinating story about uh, Marie Tharp and how uh, uh, initially um, the, the credit uh, went to uh, Houston rather than Tharp. Um, Dole links their research to uh, Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey, uh, a major center of military industrial research in the 50s. Um, one project that um, Bell Labs was pursuing at the time was the development of an underwater submarine surveillance system using telecommunication cables. Uh, to do so, it was imperative to know what the seafloor looked like. Uh, the the Heeson Tharp um, physiographic map uh, of 12 million square miles of seafloor, it's an incredible project um, in, in the Atlantic, uh, provided this. Uh, so that's kind of a brief. Um, look at, um, at what um, geopolitics uh, looked like in uh, back in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, but then the question is, what's different today? Uh, and uh, well, there's a lot that's different, but I've kind of um, uh, reduced it to uh, four different things. The first is the addition of China uh, as a major player. In the 50s and 60s, uh, uh, China certainly was not um, involved. Uh, it was the U.S. and uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, today, uh, China has joined the uh, joined the game, uh, and you know um, the clashes between China and its neighbors in the South China Sea. That is the clashes with Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Philippines. Uh, these have been widely reported. Um, I talk about this in my book, but um, I'm not going to uh, dwell on that today. Um, but what I want to uh, note is China's addition uh, as a um, major player in the Arctic. Uh, this is less known, but no less significant. Um, Chinese oil and gas drilling vessels have become a familiar site in the Kara Sea. Uh, and they've, um, they headquarter in the Russian Arctic port of Murmansk. Uh, in 2017, a, a Chinese drilling rig made one of the largest gas discoveries in, in the uh, Russian Arctic sh uh, shelf. Uh, China has also invested uh, in an icebreaker called the Snow Dragon. Um, and uh, it's lobbied to become its an observer uh, at the Arctic Council. Um, although China has no um, actual um, connection with, with the Arctic uh, uh, geographically. Um, and I mean, the, China has also attempted to acquire significant uh, uh, um, chunks of uh, land in, in Greenland and other places. Uh, China is here to stay and China is uh, um, uh, a major player in uh, the geopolitics of uh, the Arctic. The uh, second thing um, I want to, to look at here. Um, so uh, the second uh, thing that I want to look at um, are the increasing number of uh, proliferation of boundary disputes that revolve around uh, claims to an extended continental shelf. Um, now, uh, this requires a, a bit of um, explanation. Uh, this is a, an extremely uh, complex uh, issue, uh, very much uh, uh, the thing of, of uh, uh, maritime uh, law. Um, but basically, uh, it, this was triggered by a provision under Article 76 of the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention, uh, or UNCLOS. Uh, this was um, uh, it was passed in the 1980s, but proclaimed in 1984. And uh, according to this provision, um, the, um, it allowed that a, a coastal state could uh, assert subsurface rights um, beyond the existing 200-mile uh, uh, nautical exclusive economic zone. Uh, and just to back up a little bit, 
Um, the ocean is now developed in, into, uh, you know, 12 miles, uh, which is territorial waters, the next 200 miles, which is called the exclusive economic zone, uh, in which uh, um, a nation does not have uh, complete um, uh, territorial rights, but has uh, considerable rights over uh, things like uh, um, uh, oil and gas development uh, and fishing and, and the like. Um, well, um, this provision um, stated that, that if a nation could um, convince um, a, a UN agency called the UN Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf uh, that a geographic link exists between landmass and adjacent underwater formations, um, then uh, they um, could um, assert um, not territorial rights, but, but certainly they could uh, include it as part of their uh, exclusive economic system. Um, and uh, this has led to uh, a whole raft of, of different uh, geopolitical conflicts. Um, this can be seen in disputes between China and its neighbors in the South China Sea. Um, and in the polar Arctic, um, it's resulted in conflicts between, uh, well, largely three nations, uh, Canada, uh, Denmark, and, and Russia. Um, lodging a claim under Article 76 is very extremely complex. Uh, it takes a long time, it's costly. Uh, it involves very detailed geoscientific assessments. Um, the um, first of these to be heard by the uh, CLCS was from Denmark who um, uh, claimed um, that um, uh, it claimed 85,000 square kilometers, uh, including thousands of hectares of seafloor, um, previously um, um, claimed by Russia. Um, and uh, you can see from this uh, diagram uh, appears a lot of different places. Um, and, but basically this shows your overlapping claims uh, between uh, different nations uh, on the uh, Arctic shelf. Um, and each of them is saying uh, it's, it's ours because our, uh, our continental shelf um, continues on and, and extends uh, and therefore gives us, uh, uh, gives us rights. Um, the basis of the Danish claim uh, was that the, the Lomonosov um, Ridge, um, which is an 1800 kilometer long underwater mountain range that splits the Arctic in two. Um, well, um, Denmark claimed it was actually an extension of uh, Greenland. Canada and Russia each claim that the ridge is an extension of their own continental shelf. Um, and, uh, you know, so these Arctic continental shelf claims, um, you know, continue on. Uh, while the area around these ridges may be uh, rich in oil and gas resources, uh, although there's quite a bit of debate that goes on amongst ex experts whether, uh, in fact, uh, uh, they're um, the mother load uh, with regards to oil and gas or not. Um, the real value is political and symbolic, um, particularly because the uh, area in question um, <clears throat> extends all the way to, uh, and you can see on, on the map, um, to the North Pole. Um, as Professor um, Klaus Dodds at the Royal Holloway University of London told the BBC in 2020, you can imagine what's gonna happen uh, if Russia wins at the CLCS. Uh, President Putin will stand somewhere very grand. Uh, you'll have an enormous map of the Arctic beside him and he's going to say, the Arctic is ours. Uh, well, um, you know, in, in light of what's happening today in the, in the Ukraine, uh, you can certainly think about that. Um, the, um, insofar as the, the CLCS does not have jurisdiction to assign the ridge to any one uh, nation, uh, or at least the region and surrounding territories, all it can do is rule on the efficacy of scientific claims, um, which means that ultimately this will become uh, a matter of geopolitical negotiation or maybe conflict. Um, you know, in other words, uh, to, to really figure out who owns uh, these, uh, these ridges, these continental uh, shelf extensions or whatever um, is going to be a matter of negotiating a, a, a treaty. Um, so, um, you know, this is one of the, if you're talking about the geopolitical politics of the deep oceans uh, in this day and age. 
then uh, really Arctic continental shelf claims are, uh, are really um, significant. Okay, thirdly, um, ship, the ships and submarines that, the, and even more recently underwater drones that uh, dominated in the 50s and 60s are being supplanted um, by a um, a new by new technologies uh, made possible by advances in, in artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, and let me tell you, it is a uh, it's a wild new world uh, underneath the surface when it comes to these uh, these technologies. Um, <clears throat> what makes all of this necessary is that um, there are limitations on communication systems. Um, Underseas, uh, the opaqueness of water um, interferes with radio waves and wireless uh, signals. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure um, Philippe will tell us more about this later. Um, the um, the key task here uh, has been what's called the autonomous path planning, uh, which allows vehicles to avoid underwater obstacles and unanticipated terrain uh, features. Uh, and uh, particularly with regards to underwater mining, this has been a big uh, uh, block, a uh, big obstacle so far, uh, is that uh, even if they put these uh, um, monster uh, machines down to the uh, uh, sea floor, they're not mobile. Uh, the, uh, they're very, very difficult for them to move and particularly uh, to move in, in terrain that is, uh, uh, is not flat. Um, a new computer vision system mounted on underwater vehicles promises to provide vast amounts of data on seabed inhabitants in order to inform conservation and uh, biodiversity management. That's, that's the good, good news. But more ominously, um, you know, half a century after the dives of the, the Nautilus uh, in, in the skate, the Navy, I'm talking here primarily about the US Navy, but believe me, the same thing is happening with other navies. Uh, um, China, for example, is uh, engaged in the same type of thing. Um, the um, Navy has embraced a repertoire of self-powered robotic military systems, uh, which is uh, the title that's come to uh, be assigned to this is uh, Cheap Stealth. Uh, and let me give you a couple examples. One example is what's called the Upward Falling Payload Program that was uh, developed by DARPA, the US Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Um, these are, uh, it sounds like science fiction, but uh, it's real. Uh, these are deployable robot pads. Uh, they hi hibernate in special containers on the deep floor for years. Uh, and then they're um, activated by a remote secret signal. Um, they're not weapons per se, or at least not yet, um, but they're equipped for capabilities described by their developers as situational awareness, uh, disruption, deception, networking, rescue, uh, any other uh, mission that benefits from being uh, pre-distributed and hidden. Uh, in another cheap stealth project, uh, the Office of Naval Research, together with the U.S. Naval uh, Underseas Welfare Center, has funded a multi-university project, the goal of which is to build a large robotic jellyfish. Um, and um, this is charged by, or this is uh, powered by rechargeable uh, nickel metal hyd hydride batteries to patrol the oceans. Um, now, once again, I mean, you, you have uh, uh, a positive and, and, and negative dimension to this. More positively, the uh, some engineers at the University of Southampton developed a robotic uh, jellyfish that is, uh, evidently uh, promises to be a really valuable tool in terms of protecting coral reefs. Um, but uh, also um, the other side of this, and particularly in the uh, project I described uh, from the US Navy, uh, these could play a role in covert military uh, operations. Uh, so that's just a very brief um, glimpse into uh, to what's, what's happening technologically and particularly technologically um, developing uh, devices uh, that can be used uh, underwater. Um, one of the things that's giving rise to this, by the way, is, is that um, other nations, particularly China and that, have uh, set up systems uh, where you can't 
penetrate their, their waters very well using submarines or ships or anything anymore. Uh, so you have to uh, come up with these cheap stealth uh, types of things that, that are more difficult to, to pick up using advanced uh, kind of radar systems. Okay, finally, um, there are uh, a number of uh, proliferating or proliferating number of disputes uh, around the exploitation of uh, deep sea marine resources. Um, the, the term blue economy, which I'm sure you've heard, um, is um, refers to the exploitation of deep sea marine resources. Um, and, um, you know, the, the debate goes on. There are those who pitch seabed mining as a way to transition away from fossil fuels. And um, then on the other side, there are uh, civil so society sector actors who stress the need to protect fragile marine ecosystems. Um, and <clears throat> the environmental groups are um, really Johnny come lately uh, with regards to this. Uh, for a long time, um, you know, other than devote some attention uh, to overfishing and, and uh, um, marine plastics, um, the environmental groups, uh, strangely enough, uh, uh, did not really pay a lot of attention to what was happening under the oceans. Uh, that's changing now. Uh, the big environmental groups have discovered uh, the deep oceans. Um, <clears throat> this past December, uh, 20 activists from uh, Greenpeace scaled the deep sea mining vessel in Rotterdam port to deploy a banner uh, reading, no deep sea mining. Uh, the, <clears throat> the drilling ship um, named the Hidden Gem, great name, uh, is longer than two football fields. It's wider than four double-decker buses laid end to end, and it was preparing for mining trials in 2022-2023. Two months later, after the Greenpeace uh, uh, protest, uh, a group of protesters from Ocean Rebellion, which is a, a climate action group uh, linked to Extinction Rebellion, uh, demonstrated alongside uh, the hidden gem, uh, which is still uh, in Rotterdam Port, and um, Strangely enough, uh, the protesters were dressed as a whale, uh, an anemone, and a jellyfish. Um, well, in the next section of my talk, um, I want to focus specifically on deep sea mining, um, both as a, a geopolitical canvas and as a threat to biodiversity and sustainability. Um, how am I doing time-wise uh, on this, Sophie? Am I... Um, you're, you're doing fine. <laughs> Carry okay, on. Okay, good. Um, in, in a 2020 review article in the journal Nature Sustainability, um, three researchers, Lisa Levy, uh, Diva uh, Ammon, and Hannah Lilly, note that the deep sea floor is presently along with the Antarctic, Antarctic uh, the only area on Earth where mineral resources are not uh, to date extracted commercially. Um, so just consider for a moment, why not? Uh, well, uh, part of this uh, came from a, a kind of fundamental scientific error. And that was for most of human history, there was a widely shared perception that, uh, quote, there's nothing down there. And right up until the mid 20th century, uh, unbelievably, oceanographic researchers still more or less subscribed to what was called the azoic hypothesis that stated that no life exists in the oceans beneath 500 meters. Most scientists assumed that the seafloor was a vast plain, empty and still, devoid of life. Um, and this seemed to be confirmed by a century of dredging studies, beginning with the famous uh, Challenger expedition in 1872 to 1876, which is uh, often credited as laying the foundation for the uh, science of oceanography. These studies committed a fundamental error. Uh, what was brought up in trawls and dredges were large surface dwelling marine animals, such as sea cucumbers, sea urchins, and mollusks. The rich ecological communities at deeper depths were overlooked. Uh, and ironically, the Challenger's nets hauled up um, black potato-shaped particles from the seabed. These turned out to be manganese nodules, today the leading commodity in deep sea mining. Um, but no one knew what value they had other than this scientific uh, curiosities. Uh, so, I mean, the, the first thing uh, that militated against um, uh, deep sea mining up until relatively recently uh, was 
uh, a lack of understanding that, uh, that uh, basically the, uh, uh, the deep seas, uh, particularly uh, as you head towards the seabed, were seen as uh, basically uh, dead and uninteresting. Uh, commercial interest in the deep ocean began in the late 1950s, uh, thanks to a series of technological breakthroughs and uh, uh, geological discoveries. Um, one important milestone was the uh, voyage of a ship called the, the Glomar Challenger. It was a 10,000 ton state-of-the-art uh, drilling ship. Um, and it, um, um, for commercial purposes, it, uh, it located um, oil potential at 12,000 feet beneath the surface, which was uh, a first. Um, but the Glomar Challenger um, uh, almost uh, serendipitous, serendipitously uh, provided some incredibly important scientific uh, findings. Um, you know, it, it went for years drilling core samples along the oceanic ridge between South America and uh, Africa, and it provided a definitive proof of the continental drift hypothesis. Um, but, um, you know, for, for commercial mining, it, it was the, uh, uh, the oil, uh, finding the oil at that depth that was, um, that turned out to be important. Uh, in the three decades from 70, 1970 to 2000, the deep sea mining industry <coughs> seemed poised at several points to burst forth only to fall back. Uh, partly this was, um, uh, a reflection of market forces, um, you know, Commodity prices, right? Uh, when uh, the um, uh, price of minerals goes up, uh, then uh, drilling underwater uh, looks more attractive. Uh, it's much like uh, fracking is exactly the same thing. Fracking activity uh, rises and, and falls in, in terms of uh, the availability and price of oil. Um, so, you know, um, this, there was excitement about uh, underwater uh, mining and then commodity prices uh, in the resource sector would drop back. And, and uh, um, the, the other thing was technology. Uh, mining underwater is not like mining uh, on the surface. Uh, it is uh, very technologically uh, complex. A decade ago, all eyes in the mining industry were on uh, a pilot project called Sawero One. Um, uh, in the territorial waters uh, off the coast of Papua New Guinea. Um, and Nautilus Minerals um, planned to use a fleet of 200 ton robotic machines to collect manganese nodules off the ocean floor. Uh, however, it faced a number of obstacles, um, difficulty in securing adequate funding, environmental opposition, technological failures, uh, and the company uh, uh, ultimately went bankrupt, although it's, uh, it's now um, turned over and it's one of the, uh, uh, under a different name and different financing is one of the uh, uh, leading uh, deep water uh, mining companies. Um, today, deep mining is on another upward trajectory, uh, spurred in large part by the demand for metals required in the production of batteries to be uh, installed in electric cars. Uh, and of course, this is magnified by the current tilt towards alternative energy uh, monetized by uh, oil and gas shortages. Okay, um, I wanna um, just briefly, uh, first of all, talk about uh, what is it that's being mined uh, and, and where's it found? Well, um, first of all, there are three locations. Um, First of all, there's, uh, I've referred to them a couple of times already, polymetallic nodules, uh, or they're sometimes called mang manganese nodules. Uh, as I said earlier, they look kind of like uh, uh, potatoes. Um, and uh, they're located on the abyssal plain uh, seabed. Um, and, you know, these, um, <clears throat> among other things, not only do they have, uh, um, significant uh, portions of, of, of them are constituted by manganese. Um, but like a lot of these uh, um, underwater uh, minerals, they're in a um, pure state. Uh, so, you know, if you manage to, uh, to mine these, uh, then uh, they're a much purer version of it than you would get uh, with um, land mining. 
Um, and you know, how do you uh, get at these uh, manganese nodules? Well, you basically vacuum them up or uh, um, dredge them up. Uh, they're lying there, uh, loose. They've formed over millions of years. Um, you basically vacuum them up, um, bring them up to the surface onto a ship, uh, and uh, you know, um, process them and then uh, send them off on on the ship. Uh, second of all, uh, there are uh, what are called polymetallic sulfides. Uh, these are rich in zinc, copper, silver, gold, uh, and these are um, located uh, on um, hydrothermal vents. Um, these are hydrothermal vents you've probably seen. This is incredible. Uh, the, um, one variety of them called the black smoker in particular is uh, uh, visually uh, amazing. Uh, these come from fissures on the seafloor. Uh, geotherm geothermally heated water uh, discharges up through these fissures uh, from the ocean floor. Uh, and as, as they rise up, uh, hit the cool water, uh, then they often um, will uh, solidify uh, into these incredible looking, look almost like uh, wild sculptures coming up from the uh, uh, ocean floor. Um, but they're, they're rich in these, these minerals. Um, how do you mine them? Uh, well, literally, uh, they have, cr they, you, the crust uh, on these things, uh, um, <coughs> or no, the, these ones, um, sorry, the hydrothermal vents, you, uh, uh, there's all kinds of uh, minerals that form along on the ocean floor uh, around where the thermal vents have, are, are rising up. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, uh, you have to find a way, and they haven't found a really good way yet, but you have to find a way of uh, uh, scooping them up. Uh, and then finally, there are crusts. Uh, these uh, form along uh, mid-ocean ridges um, or seamounts. Um, these are underwater mountains, many of which come from extinct volcanoes. Um, how do you mine those? You uh, basically scrape the uh, crust off. Uh, they're rich in cobalt, uh, lithium, nickel. Um, but again, uh, the problems of this in part are technological, and that is uh, uh, how do you develop uh, machines uh, that are able to uh, scrape uh, these crusts off? Um, but nonetheless, uh, uh, there are a number of countries that are particularly interested, Japan uh, is particularly interested in uh, uh, mining these crusts. Okay, um, this is um, a, um, a map, uh, again, it's a map. I think this one came from, uh, uh, one of, from the UN agency um, and um, that looks after this. Uh, this is um, an area uh, the Clarion Clipperton uh, fraction zone, um, which is uh, um, an area uh, in the Pacific, um, in the Western Pacific. It's uh, located between Hawaii and, and Mexico. Uh, and uh, the greatest um, um, collection of uh, uh, nodules, of uh, manganese nodules, are strewn across a wide uh, area in the uh, Clarion Clipperton zone. Okay, uh, next, um, what I wanna look at is um, the environmental threats um, that, um, that basically uh, um, come from this. Um, there are multiple problems of mining the uh, sea floor. Um, well, starting of manganese nodules, uh, the vacuuming process kicks up a dust storm, which takes days to settle. Vast plumes of resuspended sediment uh, potentially could choke biological communities for uh, miles around. Um, the, these nodules, as well as uh, uh, crusts and sulfides, act as a substrate for a unique fauna. Uh, mining will remove or crush these organisms. Um, mining nodules could also unleash uh, a cascade effect which uh, impacts uh, ocean currents that uh, circumnavigate the globe. Um, the environmental group, um, Fauna and Flora International, suggests that deep sea mining could 
could well turn out to be the stuff of nightmares. Uh, Greenpeace has pointed to the disruption in carbon storage um, posed by mining the ocean floor. And I think we had a, a previous session uh, that perhaps looked at uh, uh, carbon storage. Um, a 2018 um, paper in the journal Frontiers of Marine Science is appropriately uh, titled Deep Sea Mining with No Loss of Diversity, an Impossible Aim. Uh, so there, there's a lot of things to be very worried about uh, with regards to um, uh, deep sea underwater mining. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about, um, and this is a huge topic uh, in and of itself, so I, I certainly can't do it justice in two minutes. But um, and this is uh, the regulation of seafloor mining. Um, the International Seabed Mining Authority, or the ISA, is the chief regulatory mechanism. It was established by UNCLOS, the United Nations Law of the Sea, to oversee mineral extraction on the uh, ocean floor uh, beyond national um, jurisdiction. This is an important topic, beyond national uh, jurisdiction. Uh, it became operational in 2011. Uh, and in fact, negotiations at the, uh, the law of the sea were de deadlocked for a decade, primarily due to disagreement um, between countries likely to engage in deep sea mining in the future who wanted to create, quote, a, an orderly gold rush um, and developing nations who wanted to share in the spoils on the grounds, grounds that the ocean was part of the common heritage of uh, humankind. Um, at the core of this were issues pertaining to the powers functions, tasks, and internal decision-making structures that define the ISA's powers. From its inception, there was um, um, sharp debate over these powers. Defenders insisted that the ISA, uh, its mandates and powers went well beyond other international organizational agencies. Um, critics identified the gaps and restrictions on its powers. They pointed out that the ISA was tasked of overseeing the commercial development of the sea, seabed, uh, but not the water column above. Um, yeah, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you stir up um, dust and, and uh, sediments and everything on the ocean floor, that they, they drift upwards, right? And, and uh, the ISA only uh, has really has jurisdiction on what happens on on the seabed, not uh, not when it migrates. Uh, also, the agency was not given jurisdiction over bioprospecting, which uh, remains virtually unregulated uh, or virtually unregulated outside territorial waters. Um, it um, wasn't. It had conflicting jurisdiction in the Antarctic, which is governed uh, largely by the Antarctic Treaty. Um, essentially, the ISA is trapped in a contradiction, which is embedded uh, in its brief. On the one hand, it's a regulator with a mandate to shape and control deep sea mining by issuing licenses for exploration and exploitation of the seabed. Uh, and just a note here, the licenses they've issued so far are for uh, exploration. Uh, they've yet to issue um, licenses for the actual mining, the exploitation, uh, although there's tremendous pressure on them now to begin uh, doing this. Um, furthermore, the ISA was handed the responsibility um, for um, environmentally protecting the area. Uh, this is the seabed and the ocean floor and subsoil beyond the limits of national jurisdiction, uh, although this power is somewhat vague. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, um, it's issuing licenses for mining, but at the same time, it's supposed to protect the environment. Uh, but, but here's the really difficult thing. Um, the UNCLOS designated the ISA as an operational mining company called the Enterprise. Um, which was expected to undertake projects of its own. Um, the goal of this was to assist developing countries by generating royalties for them and uh, sharing state-of-the-art mining technologies. Uh, so thus the ISA was uh, expected to be at one and the same time a commercial developer and the agency that regu regulated this activity. Uh, what was not foreseen was that the ISA would be captured by the mining contractors that they were overseeing. And this is what's happening now. Uh, Greenpeace has documented this in several reports. Um, one was called Deep Trouble, the Murky World of, deep sea mine, of the Deep Sea Mining Industry. Another was called Deep Water, the Emerging Threat of Deep Sea Mining. Um, and uh, most recently, uh, well, just a few weeks ago in April, uh, the Los Angeles Times ran a long investigative article uh, entitled 
Uh, a gold rush in the deep sea raises questions about authority charged of protecting it. Uh, and both the Greenpeace reports and the LA Times article raised some troubling questions about the close relationship between the ISA and the companies to whom it issue, issues permits and who have been pressing it to begin uh, issuing exploitation licenses within two years. Um, what's opened the door to all of this is a loophole uh, in the ISA charter, which allows small nations who would otherwise lack the resources to engage in seabed mining to partner with commercial operators uh, to apply for an exploration permit. Unfortunately, this has led to a situation where big mining contractors have recruited small Pacific nations, Nauru, Tonga, uh, Tuvalu, uh, to front their uh, development projects. Uh, at present, there are four uh, main corporate players. Uh, the most visible of these has been the UK Seabed Resources, uh, which is in fact controlled by uh, the aerospace uh, defense contractor Lockheed Martin. Um, these I won't go into the other ones, but uh, um, you know they're in, in many different countries and many different kind of economic functions. Um, this has been facilitated by um, the structure in the ISA, which devolves power down from uh, from the council uh, to the secretary general and something called the legal and technical commission, uh, and. Uh, the commission in particular is increasingly dominated by marine consultants, mining contractors with uh, very little representation by conservationists or uh, oceanographers. Um, okay, just to conclude then, um, in a recent brief policy brief, um, a, a group uh, called the, the T7 or Think7 engagement group under the German uh, G7 uh, presidency um, well, the authors made a series of recommendations, what's they called, safeguarding the blue planet. These included uh, eliminating national subsidies that contribute to overfishing, um, reducing marine debris uh, through a comprehensive global agreement on plastics pollution, uh, integrating ocean criteria into, a, uh, sustainabil into sustainability finance frameworks, um, even setting up something called an ocean sustainability bank. Um, the, T7 task force also addressed deep sea mining. Uh, and it said, this is what it said, given the high risk and associated uncertainties, G7 countries should pause the development of activities in relation to the exploitation of deep sea minerals. Uh, and this is a view that increasingly is being um, uh, expressed uh, by scientists, by uh, uh, um, many of those in, in civil society. Uh, and this should apply both within, within the EEZ, the Economic Exclusion Zone, uh, and also in the ABNG, which stands for Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. Uh, and there should be a moratorium until the impacts of deep sea uh, seabed mining are comprehensively understood. Uh, and furthermore, the G7 members, and again, this applies not just to the G7, but to, uh, to the wider um, world, uh, G7 members should foster transparent and inclusive dialogues, uh, a dialogue on the future of deep sea mining with China and other uh, um, major actors. The T7 task force uh, recommendations make a lot of sense. No doubt they'll provide a framework for discussion at the uh, uh, UN Ocean Conference, which is coming up next month in uh, Lisbon. Um, that said, the political economy of oceans, including the deep sea, um, you know, extends beyond G7 democracies in the United Nations. Uh, referring specifically to the challenge to the um, to the challenges to the sustainability of deep sea mining, um, Lisa Levin, the oceanographer, and her uh, co-authors in another paper uh, conclude that the weight given to precaution and uncertainty will depend, in part, on political, industry, and civil society awareness of the issues, um, the extent of stakeholder engagement, and the degree of regulatory competence. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much indeed, John. That was com completely fascinating. Um, I, I learned a huge amount from that. I think there's a, a, a couple of the points in the, in the chat, the questions that um, have come up actually relate to issues I think you ended up covering in the sort of last quarter of your piece about national jurisdictions and where they stop and the International Seabed Authority. I think um, uh, you set out very clearly its limits and the, its role in its limits, but perhaps we can come back to some of those issues in the discussion. I'd like now to turn in the time we have to Philippe, my colleague Philippe Blondel uh, and then to Aurélie Charles just to 
respond briefly to your uh, presentation, John, say some other things uh, to add to the discussion. So, Philippe, if I could come to you first. Yes, thank you. And thank you, John, for a very energizing talk about the different aspects of geopolitics in the oceans. This was definitely a deep dive. And uh, I felt really privileged to have worked in many of the areas that you mentioned. And uh, my few slides are more about supporting geopolitics with the acoustics, so how we can bring the evidence base that better minds than us can actually use in these international and very important discussions and negotiations. And uh, talking about deep sea mining, for example, this is an image taken from uh, Nautilus Minerals, which uh, uh, we talked about earlier. It shows how deep sea mining can go down a depth of uh, several kilometers of water. And most of what we know about the oceans is actually taken from acoustics. Sound waves are the only ones that can penetrate to all depths in the oceans. Light, if you've been diving in the ocean, you know that light is actually decreasing little by little and by 200 meters we don't see anything and a lot of the animals are using sounds as well with uh, tools like side scan sonar or other sonars we can map the oceans find out what they are what they are made of where the volcanoes are where the habitats are but we can also use sound for example to look at how noisy our different activities are and just looking at deep sea mining we can see we have a local focus about the impact of noise, sediments, and uh, debris, waste from mining. That's indeed a big uh, question that uh, you explained very well. And there is another impact on what happens on the seabed. In terms of noise, we have regulations. For example, Europe is the only part of the world with uh, working regulations on good environmental status. It's called the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. But we have lots of standards about what is allowed and not allowed in the oceans. I'm not going to talk more about that, apart from advertising more and more for acoustics, and uh, to give time to the next speaker as well to uh, uh, explain the exciting things that she's been working on. One thing to remember is that things change when we go to the Arctic. This is recent work that we are presenting uh, in a few weeks at an international conference, and we presented it last year as well, where we measure the amount of sound at different frequencies associated to shipping noise, and just blindly using metrics shows that we have a lot of noise which could be associated to ships when there are no ships around because of the amount of ice. So we have to be very careful about how we measure what we measure and what it tells us. Some of the work we do with uh, uh, the International Quiet Ocean Experiment is to actually pool all our observations in the Arctic to understand better how marine life is affected by climate change, how climate change works, and uh, how human activities can be mitigated or modulated to better protect the planet. And for once, I was very pleased to see that in some of the conferences we had, this, has, this was actually passed on to the politicians, like in the Arctic Science Ministerials that occur every two years. And people actually said, yes, we need to do what the scientists do. So it was very exciting to see, uh, to see how the acoustics and the science could be based, could be used as evidence to explain and support the different geopolitical decisions. So thank you, John, again, for a very interesting talk, uh, ranging really around the world and around the different depths. And I will pass on to Aurélie now. Great, thank you very much, Philippe. It's really interesting. Aurélie, over to you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Philippe. Many thanks, Professor Hannigan, for your uh, brilliant presentation. I've also uh, learned a lot. I will share my screen now to present really a, a brief comment on uh, the political economy of uh, our uh, deep oceans. Right. So the, the main comment really I had here was essentially to try to look at those exclusive economic zones you were talking about as You've said in international law, it's quite complex issues, and you've seen an increase. We've seen an increase in the number of boundary disputes uh, revolving around those claims 
Uh, you mentioned the South China Sea, for example, that many uh, examples could be, uh, we could be looking at here. So what are we talking about here? So I provided here a brief diagram from the World Ocean Review of uh, the areas we are looking at, the exclusive economic zone here, up to 200 nautic uh, uh, miles. And the areas of district are really around uh, where we can reach uh, that deep ocean and that uh, how do we overlap the exclusive economic zone with this uh, deep ocean and the exploitation of resources. So we're talking here about the dark blue areas around the continent and, and around the, um, the oceans. Here, we're looking at areas where sovereign states can explore and make use of marine uh, resources. So that was set up essentially in the early 1980s. So when neoclassical and neoliberal policies have, uh, have started to blossom around the, the, the world, especially on our lands, certainly. Uh, and the main critique here, uh, which is taken from Marina Mazzucato is really about uh, when we focus on the use value of resources, the price itself becomes the value of our resources. And that completely shifts the, the, the paradigm in terms of then the uh, exploitation of uh, human and natural resources and tend to place uh, and classify our current planetary diseases such as ocean uh, acidif acidification as negative externalities. So what are the lessons really we can draw from the Anthropocene on the dry land? Uh, we've seen a huge loss in, bi loss in biodiversity in uh, agriculture, and we have a, a number of lectures in IPI. You can go back to if you're interested uh, for short-term economic returns. We also see that um, colonialism of, of people and resources have led to the consumption and production patterns we've seen uh, over the Great Acceleration period that uh, is, is leading to the climate crisis we're currently experiencing. And it's certainly at the heart of the current disputes uh, we see here, talking about that use value of resources and taking it as uh, granted. We see, however, a few positive uh, interventions. Uh, and, and I will briefly mention, for example, the huge work that's been done by the Ocean Foundation. And we had uh, uh, the president of the Ocean Foundation a few weeks ago talking about community-led incentives and initiative that has been uh, put forward, certainly also drawing on the work of Eleanor Ostrom uh, on governing the common and uh, socio-ecological systems. Uh, and we also see uh, the uh, current um, Global Commission on the Economics of Water, uh, building on the Descripta Review on the Economics of Diversities, taking sort of U-turns on this neoliberal uh, paradigm and focusing much more on system thinking. So it's a system level approach to water governance uh, that is looking at here, uh, the economy and the society firmly embedded within nature and not the other way around. So the focus here is really about access to water services without that sense of entitlement that the uh, exclusive economic zones can grant. So we're talking about universal access here. And I find it quite refreshing to see that uh, we have a limited time in terms of uh, acting positively and, and reversing maybe the trend on climate change. But we we'll see here that biodiversity is coming back uh, at the forefront in this type of initiatives and is being central to uh, international policy making. So by putting the dynamics of biodiversity at the heart of policy making here, I mean, the biodiversity across time and space that doesn't stop at the national boundaries that those type of zones tend to put forward, nor is it uh, looking at its use value, but rather the intrinsic uh, value that is uh, as being part of a biodiverse system. So here really it's about, we see such example to a certain extent when we think about transboundary fish stock in uh, those exclusive economic zones, but to a limited extent. Uh, we see it also in the uh, ecological and, and fishery protection zone that Croatia has, has put in place. So there are examples, positive examples of accounting for biodiversity as the primary driver for uh, international policy making. Uh, and certainly the, the work of my colleague Philippe Blondel is at the heart of trying to give a voice to the invisible. Um, so how do we try to move away from that neoliberal paradigm of the Anthropocene towards maybe sort of uh, ecocentricism. Uh, well, we have to move away from that static use value towards a dynamic, systemic value that should be at the heart 
of uh, our own survival. So how can we uh, envisage the health of the environment uh, as central for the living to be able to adapt to its environment as our um, squid here is uh, very much able to do. So thank you, Professor Han again. Thank you very much, Arlie. That's fantastic. Um, and I suppose to come back to this question of systems thinking, John, I mean, you, you were very clear that a lot of what is driving the deep sea um, mining and uh, the, 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 the attempt to you know, scrape the ocean bed to find other ways of mining is the search for what would otherwise be called rare earth metals, lithium and so on, which itself is being driven by attempts to transition to a low carbon economy via the use of batteries in electric cars and so on. So when we're thinking systemically here, as already says, if we're not thinking simply about parceling up areas for uh, resource extraction, transforming them into use values and then dealing with anything that's environmental as, a, as an external, um, an externalization uh, of a market failure. Um, how do we think systemically about connecting what's happening to the oceans to what, what else we're doing as human beings in terms of thinking about climate change transition to a, to a net zero economy? Well, that's a good point. And, um, you know, we who study the deep ocean sometimes uh, have a tendency uh, to disconnect from what's happening up on the surface, right? Uh, and, uh, but it is interconnected, right? And, and uh, the political economy of, uh, of what happens with regards to uh, uh, oil and gas shortages, electric vehicles or, or, or whatever, um, you know, certainly is, um, is anything but irrelevant uh, to what's happening um, uh, beneath the, the surface itself. Um, and you know, similarly, the geopolitics of uh, of, of what happens uh, is 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 connected uh, to beneath the surface. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things I haven't talked about. Uh, but for example, uh, there's considerable considerable geopolitical conflict between India and China. Mm. Um, you know, in terms of, of uh, uh, who has the right to send their submersibles down into uh, to what areas in order to do what. You know, um, so I mean, you're quite right. It, it's uh, uh, these are not uh, not connected. They're very much uh, connected, and uh, you know, to the extent that we can uh, uh, come up with models, systematic models uh, that connect them better, uh, then all more power to us. And in terms of the in terms of the kind of, I mean, there's a couple. There were a couple of questions, John, in the chat, which were just about this issue of uh, jurisdiction over the deep oceans. I think I think you've answered the first you know and orally as well re referring to the difference between uh you know the continental shelf and the extension of uh into economic um, extraction zones and the the deep ocean not being national property but there being this body the international seabed authority which has is a relatively new uh, uh jurisdiction which is not entirely clear and as you say arguably institutionally compromised by those it regulates um uh, the, the, so, so I suppose the answer to, to this question, the, the one that's just in the chat there, uh, would be that there is a certain point where we are outside of effective national agreements, uh, which constitute some body of international law, or where there is clear authority. The majority of the uh, high oceans, as they call them, are outside uh, jurisdiction. Yeah. Uh, now, there are, you know, attempts uh, to, in a sense, uh, in a positive way, colonize uh, areas of the, uh, uh, the deep ocean. Um, marine reserves, uh, not something I talked about today, but really important, right? And, uh, um, you know, there are um, tremendous efforts uh, underway, uh, particularly amongst the oceanographers and, uh, and others, um, to set aside uh, significant uh, areas uh, in the ocean and, and to uh, uh, designate them as marine reserves uh, in which no one can uh, come in and uh, um, basically upset the, the ecology of, of these areas. Uh, and that's a whole topic uh, unto itself with regards to, um, you know, uh, jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but it's difficult. It's difficult because as you can guess, uh, the, the areas that have been set aside as marine reserves uh, to date uh, tend to uh, be areas that are not threatened. Uh, and uh, um, therefore, um, you know, if, if it's not threatened, you don't have stakeholders. 
right? Uh, so it's easy to take a, an area in, as has happened, you know, in the uh, Pacific, uh, in which there's uh, not a heck of a lot of fishing or anything else uh, going on, and the designated a marine reserve, right? And uh, then proclaim that we've we've reclaimed the part of the high ocean. That's easy, but when, when you start trying to uh, establish marine reserves uh, closer to coastlines or, or in areas uh, in which uh, there are conflicts over mining and fishing and things like that. Uh, then we get into, um, you know, political conflicts uh, because there are stakeholders and, uh, and they fight back. Yeah, yeah. and from what, from what you were saying, I mean, the Arctic certainly seems like a lost cause in that regard. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, great. Okay. Um, Philippe, I don't know if you had your, did you have your hand up, Philippe? Sorry. I, I... Yes, I did. Uh, it was just to add, so we talk about the International Seabed Authority for the seabed. For what happens at the surface of the oceans, there are international agreements like MARPOL, the Maritime, Maritime Pollution Conventions that date back to the 60s, 70s. They are very strict about how much pollution or how little pollution you're allowed to create in the deep oceans. Mm -hmm. The only problem, like any agreement, is enforcement. If mm -hmm. you're out in the deep sea and you start to dump things there, if no one notices, no one can tell you you're doing something bad. Mm -hmm. So it's also being able to monitor and enforce these agreements. Mm -hmm. There's a crazy quilt of uh, treaties and, and uh, uh, you know, regulatory, uh, well, regulatory reach, as you say, is, is the problem, you know? Uh, yeah, how, how do you monitor it? Uh, I mean, they're, they're attempting to do this, uh, you know, they're, uh, you know, among other things, at least on, on the surface, they're in, installing uh, mechanisms on um, commercial ships now. Uh, to be able to basically track where they are and where they aren't. And, uh, you know, uh, that is said to off offer one, one solution, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it really is a crazy quilt of uh, regulation or lack of regulation. <laughs> yeah, I think as you were saying in your talk, John Norsey, there's also military cheap stealth designed mm -hmm. to avoid yeah. uh, surveillance and regulation. The first time I'd heard of robotic jellyfish as well. <laughs> uh, to me. Um, well, I'm, I'm afraid we've come to the end of the uh, time we have for this evening's lecture and discussion, but I, I want to thank you very much, John, for an absolutely fascinating talk and um, very rich and covered in an enormous amount of really interesting ground. And for those of us who are just sort of starting to get into these questions of the geopolitics of the oceans. It was very, very um, informative and uh, as were the contributions from Aurelie and from Philippe. Uh, and is, this is an area obviously where the um, disciplinary perspectives of sociologists, you know, scientists, oceanic scientists, climate change scientists and political economists can come together very fruitfully as I think um, Philippe was suggesting and where a lot of the uh, progress that we wish to see can only be made on that interdisciplinary basis. So. Um, many thanks indeed to all of you for uh, your contributions this evening, but particularly obviously John for your lecture. It's very, uh, very good to have you with us. And as I said at the beginning, we will be making this available uh, as, a, as a podcast, as a, as a video and recording uh, in due course. So uh, thanks to you all for watching this evening and for listening in. Uh, thanks again to our panelists. We have one more um, uh, lecture in this series coming up. We'll let you all know if you follow the IPR website or us on the social media, you'll see. Uh, but uh, um, again, thank you very much for this evening's contributions. Thank you, John. Thank you, Aurelie. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you. <laughs>